What's your story? What's your sign? It's like we're twin flames in a different life. Deep connection, life's a spark. It's like you know me in the depths of my heart. We're dreamers. What's your type? Somehow I wanna know all about you Deep connection, lights a spark You already know me when we dance in the dark We're dreamers What's up everyone, Conrad Newfelt here, and today, well today's a little bit different of a video than I would normally make. It's my first live broadcast, and I will admit, I am a little bit nervous and, and excited. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of live fails, but I think they're friggin' hilarious. I just don't want to be one. <laughs> so there's many ways to get like rich and famous, live fails is one of them. I do not want that at all. So hopefully this will be fun and entertaining and educational, uh, but hopefully entertaining for the right reasons. Um, today's video is for um, how to avoid first-time homebuyer mistakes. We're going to talk about some of the, uh, the the main mistakes that people make. We're going to go over Angela Pirelli's top five. And of course, to cover that, Angela Pirelli from EXP is here with us to cover off those mistakes, some of the big ones. Angela, how about you tell us a bit about yourself? Hi. Yeah, so like Conrad said, I am a realtor in Saskatoon. I've been in real estate for about 14 and a half years now. So Lots of experience with different buyers and sellers. And on the buyer side today, we are going to discuss a few of those things that people don't necessarily think about before they head out. So yeah, it'll be fun. Right on. So we're not going to talk about the top five in any order. We're not going to go like number one, two, three, four, five. I think let's just let's just talk about the five big ones and, and the impact that they have. Um, where do you want to start? What's, uh, what's a good first one? Let's start with the very first one that I swear you run into, I run into all the time. People think they can go out and start looking before they get pre-approved for a mortgage. They'll call me up and they're like, well, I just kind of want to look. I want to see what I like before they have any idea what they can afford. Yeah, or they get pre-approved and then don't listen to what you told them. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's that too. Yeah, yeah. well, 
T tell you what, can I can I take first crack at this? Because oh, honestly, sure. yeah. <laughs> this one freaking drives me nuts. Yeah. So we'll get people who jump in, right? They'll they'll go, they'll find a house. And I, honestly, there's some uh, probably some very patient realtors uh, <laughs> because they'll they'll go and show like 50 houses with a budget that they're not approved for. And then they'll go in and they'll be like, okay, great. Like, how do we get approved for this? I'm like, oh my God, you're nowhere close. Yeah. Like, you're nowhere close. Like, I think the stat that I had read the other day was like 82% of deals that fall apart are because of financing. And I believe it. It's because people don't get pre-approved. I mean, you must you must see this too, right? Like, <laughs> I like your wording. You're so nice. There's some very patient realtors. <laughs> <laughs> but they are though, right? <laughs> because, I mean... I value my time. And so I want yeah. to know if, that, if, I, if I was showing someone homes yeah. that they could actually get the mortgage that they're looking at. And I just don't think yeah. that, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's wild. Like we yeah. had one time, we had one time this guy who comes in and uh, they did the right step. They got pre-approved before house shopping mm -hmm. and we're like, Hey man, you're like, you're, you're pre-approved for like 300,000. And then he's like, oh, okay, great. And then he comes back and he's like, I put an offer in a house. Awesome. Cool, man. Like, congratulations. Like what's the, what's the house? comes across our desk and it's for 450,000. I'm oh, like, whoa, no. buddy, like you, like, no, we told you three, like 300, 350, like where, where did this 400, 450 come from? That doesn't make any sense. And and then he's like, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, my bad, my bad. I thought the rental income would help like bridge the gap. I'm like, okay, that's fair. I, under, I, under, I understand why it, it won't in this case, but you know, go back to the drawing board. So they collapsed the deal. And then a little while later, he came back to me and he's like, I got a new place. And I was like, great. We checked the deal, $800,000. I'm like, Oh man, you like, you took that advice and you went right in the wrong, wrong direction with it. Like, like you heard me, but you didn't listen. Like, yes. oh, man. But see, that's where if we're doing our jobs, we should not be writing those offers for them because I always, even if somebody messages me off a sign, like, okay, are you pre-approved? Do you know if you can actually afford this house before we go and look at it? And some people, I mean, if they've been through the process, they're like, oh yeah, for sure. This is who I'm pre-approved through. They have no problem telling you that. Great. Let's go look. Yeah. Other people, they take it as an insult. They think that you are questioning whether or not, yeah. I don't know, it's some sort of personal element, but they get mad. They won't talk to you. They tell you off. They say the meanest things. Oh. I'm like, okay, move on. But, you know, it's, it's funny because like you're, you're talking about that, how you're like, oh, you should go get pre-approved and stuff like that. Yeah. But I mean, we deal with it when we have to be the bearer of bad news in a lot of ways. Yeah. We're like, hey, you're not pre-approved yeah. for what you thought you were. And like common things that we'll see is people will be like, of course, I'll get a mortgage, right? I mean, 300000 a year is like as a, as a family, right? Of course, we'll get approved. And then you find out that, you know, they've got like $400,000 in debt and they're making $18,000 a month worth in payment. And like, that's a real thing, right? Like you see that more often than you think. I don't, so it's like, hey, so, you know, what are we pre-qualified for? It's like a Starbucks coffee. Like yeah. that's, that's basically it, yeah. what you can afford. I use you guys to be the bad guy because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they're doing on the back end. And I don't want to be the one to tell them, like, I think you're aiming kind of high. So I'm like, okay, you have to actually go talk to somebody. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you totally get to tell uh, the bad news. I got a, I got a business partner, Mitchell, and uh, he does a lot of our fulfillment. He does like the document collection, making sure everything is what it's supposed to be, conversing with the lenders and stuff. And I do a lot of the front end stuff, talking with clients and making sure they understand what's going on. And uh, whenever it's like a hard conversation, he'll always be like, hey, uh, Conrad, I got someone for you to call. <laughs> so so I, I get to be that bad guy, the, Ooh, you know, but yeah, I don't know. Or, or people will be like, oh, of course I'm going to get approved, right? And then it'll, it'll be like a, a farmer's. Farmers are actually really, really common. Like I broke her nationally, but in Saskatchewan, we'll, we'll get the farmer who comes in. And of course, they should you know be qualified for the world and stuff like that because they have no debt. They have no whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, what becomes the challenge? Well, their credit score because they don't have one because they have no debt, right? Because a mm -hmm. credit score isn't an in indication that you know, you've, you've handled your finances well, ironically. Uh, credit score is an indication of how well you've handled debt. And if you don't have debt, you don't have a credit score. And that becomes like a big significant challenge. And then there's all these extra things. And then they get, like you said, defensive and confrontational. Why can't, why can't I be approved? Why can't I whatever? Look how strong I am. And I'm like, well, if that would make sense if lending was based on common sense. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. in today's world, it's it, it's not. Like there's some things yeah. that just don't make sense. No, right? that's not true. That's a good point. Definitely. Yeah. I don't know. Or... Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna segue into you into one of your other points okay. here. Um, they'll do this, you know, where they do get approved, and then yeah. they change the underlying thing underneath that approval. So they go and make large purchases or do something dumb. So yeah. 
like, do you have any, do you have any times on the, or have you heard stories of people doing this? I got some of my own. What I hear about is people get so excited, they get their offer on their house and all of a sudden they decide they want to go buy a vehicle, you know, and they go get this huge vehicle payment and then it screws everything up. And we don't usually hear about it until all of a sudden you guys are pulling everything for like possession day. And you're like, oh crap, <laughs> you're calling us like, we don't know if this can happen. Like we, we used to have, I, we don't do it so much nowadays, but we used to have the 10 commandments of financing. Like yeah. as soon as you, as soon as you get financing, like an approval from us, right. You know, the thou shall not, mm -hmm. right. So thou shall not purchase a vehicle prior to possession date. Right. Cause like, I think what's funny is like a lot of people are like, are we approved? And they get that letter saying, yeah, you're approved. And they sign the commitment and everything's good to go. But what a lot of people don't realize, I think is that, you know, that approval can change. If the underlying yeah. assumptions, if the underlying thing that was underwritten changes, if, mm -hmm. if you screw up your credit, you declare bankruptcy, you go into, mm -hmm. you, you become insolvent. If you, you know, rack up credit card bills, if you co-sign for loans, any, literally anything, you change yeah. anything that, uh, that, that was underwritten initially, it can, it can just change everything. And people, they'll be like, well, how would they, how would they know? Right. It's like, well, they do. They pull, they pull credit checks constantly on you throughout the process and before possession, too. Like mm -hmm. we had one where the guy pulled or the, the lender pulled uh, a credit check, you know, two days prior to possession and found something that wow. we just didn't even know about. Like the, the, the client didn't even let us know. But it, fortunately, it was small enough that it, we were able to, like, make it go away. But yeah, yeah. there are some. I, yeah. It's a conversation that I have started like trying to add in when I'm talking to buyers, because I assume that they've had the conversation with their mortgage broker, but at the same time, just in case they haven't, or if they didn't click, if they didn't clue into it, just to hear it again. Yeah. And I think it's good to hear it from more than one person. Cause sometimes mm -hmm. I think um, you have to hear a message a couple of times before, for some people that before it sinks in kind of thing. Yep. And, I, and I don't think that people understand how important that one is right because once you've removed your condition of finance once mm -hmm. you've removed your conditions um you're contractually obligated you're con you contractually bound to buy that place and all, all of a sudden yeah hey okay. well yeah so i mean so say that happens to somebody and all of a sudden they can't get their mortgage they cannot complete they are pretty much having to forego that down payment so the work that they put in to saving all yep. of that not the full down payment the deposit i should say the deposit yeah so whether it's five thousand ten thousand whatever it may be they're probably losing out on that money plus they put themselves at risk of the seller suing them they do lots of time on the market all those details so it opens up a whole bag of issues that they don't like i uh i even had gotten pulled on a file one time like it wasn't my mortgage application but you know, something goofy or wonky. I can't remember the specifics of what they screwed up, but it changed. And all of a sudden they try to bring me on the file to like put it back together, like Humpty Dumpty, this thing before possession, because <laughs> like they did some goofy thing. And then all of a sudden, um, all of a sudden, yeah, they're like, well, we need, if, if they don't, the seller, the seller needs their house sold in order for them to get the financing for yes. their place. Yeah. So they're like, we're going to sue them for the damages. Cause if we have to lose our deposit, we're going to sue you for our deposit too. And like the, the amount of damages that can go along is huge. It, it can, it can be very, yeah. very big. Yeah. It can it's be big. Very yeah. Like <laughs> the, the wildest one though, I'd have to say that we've ever had, they didn't actually make a large purchase. They, uh, they spent their down payment. That one, <laughs> <laughs> that one that one blew my mind yeah so they get they get approved so they get this they get approved and they uh, like we're like yeah congratulations you're approved you know here's your approval or whatever mm -hmm. and then like 10 days prior to uh possession you know we send out our you know before the lawyer email kind of thing like hey this is what to expect you're gonna have to bring out like a, a bank draft for your you know your lawyer or whatever for the remainder of your down payment and i get a call and uh, the guy's like hey uh what do you mean this bank draft with this down payment? I'm like, well, you know, like you had to show us and we told you to like, you know, show us your down payment, your 90 day history and stuff. And we told you to keep that aside and stuff like that. I'm like, well, now you're gonna have to get a bank draft to, to give it to your lawyer so they can give it to the seller. And he's like, oh, he's like, I thought once I showed it, I didn't need it anymore. And I'm like, mm, no, like, what do you mean? What do you mean you don't need it anymore? And he's like, he's like, yeah, I thought once I showed it, I just, you know, I could use it now. I'm like, and I just knew where the conversation was going. I'm like, what did you, I'm like, okay, so are you telling me you don't have the down payment anymore? And he's like, no, man. It's like, what did you do with it? And he's like, I bought a, I bought a trailer for my, for my, I think it was a skidoo or something like that. And I was like, no, I'm like, <laughs> and he's like, so what do we do, man? I'm like, yeah. He's like, so what do we do? I'm like, 
well, you go and sell the freaking trailer, man. <laughs> he's like, well, he's like, I might not get everything back though. I might not get, I'm like, wow, that's an expensive lesson. Cause trust me, you don't want to like, you don't want all these other more expensive lessons, but. Oh. That's crazy. I've never run into that, but see, there's another thing. I'll learn that one and I'll tell people, I'll be like, okay, do yeah. not use this now. Well, we used to have people, yeah, we used to have people like go like, the, like I said, our 10 commandments of thou shall not. And they're like, do you actually have to tell people this? I'm like, everything is on that list because someone has done that thing. Well, and it's that element where stuff that we take for granted because we're in the industry all the time, we don't yep. realize it's not common knowledge to everybody else. But yeah. you do, you know, you've just know. got all those little details in there. But I also feel like, and maybe you can, maybe you have an opinion on this, but I also feel like it's getting worse. I feel like there's so little education out there, at least financially, mm -hmm. that oh, like, yes. That like even even my kids, I try to drill it into them constantly about how like like what a credit card is, a debit card is, how financing works, all that stuff. Because I just feel like that education is just absent. It's not even it's not even that people are stupid; it's that they're ignorant, which is two very different things. No, that's you know, very true. I would agree. Stupid is stupid is when you know the answer or should know the answer and you just don't. Ignorant yeah. is you just know had no possible way of knowing the answer because no one ever took the time to teach it to you. Yes, exactly. And I think that's honestly what it is most of the time. It's not done out of any sort of like, <laughs> yeah, you know, just well, choosing to make that decision. And but. if it's like new to Canada, I'll be like, yeah. I'll, I'll take more time to explain what I, I think would be regular knowledge to a Canadian because, you mm -hmm. know, things are different here than they are elsewhere. Right. That's that's Fair kind of obvious. But every now and then I'll get some rich doctor's kid or whatever, and they're just loaded to the hills and then, and they understand nothing. I'm like, how is that possible? Yes, like, exactly. Like, like you're well off. <laughs> you, you have money. How do you not know how to protect that money? It yes. It blows, blows me away. It but, comes too easy sometimes. Yeah. So then yeah. probably one of my favorite uh, th things on the top five in your list. And it's the, it's the, oh, not that one. This one. Oh yeah. Not paying attention to listen one. to this. Yeah. I learned this one in an interesting way. So years ago when all the Google assistants, Alexas, all that kind of stuff started to come out, it wasn't even that the doorbells were very popular then, but we were walking through a house and they had a little Google assistant sitting on the counter, but I didn't even think anything of it because it was so new. And the client I was with worked in the technology industry. And as we're walking through, he said, Hey Google. And Google answered and said, like, yeah, I can't or whatever, just answered him. And he said, are you recording? And Google said, yes, I am. As we were walking through this house, so any conversation my buyers and I were having, Google was recording. So he specifically, he said, Google, stop recording. Google erased the last recording. So he took over and it listened to him in that seller's Whoa. house. He asked it to erase, but it was, it was recording. Everybody's coming through. So if you're walking through a house and you're saying, I absolutely love this. Like I would pay anything for this. I will do whatever they want. You've given away your whole negotiating standpoint in the seller's house and they're listening to you. And the exact same thing happens with those doorbells because people think once they step out of the house that they're safe, but those doorbells, oh, yeah. they can record. Like there was one situation, I was at a conference where again, tech guy came up. He had a nest, I think it was either nest or ring. Yeah. And he said that some kids have been messing around with fences and stuff in the neighborhood. So he pulled the video footage from his camera and he said, even though you couldn't hear them, you could, or sorry, you couldn't see them. You could hear the kids down the block to the point that they recognize the voices and were able to catch every single kid. So even when you leave the house, you're walking out your car, if you're discussing your thoughts on that house, those sellers get that all on recording. And yeah. So what do, you, what do you do then? Do you like wait? Um, until you're like in the car to start talking or what? Well, we don't even travel in the same cars very much anymore since COVID. Right, I guess with COVID, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I usually tell people, I give them a heads up before we ever go out. I give them the story of the one that I walked through with the Google Assistant. I tell them about the doorbells and I said, honestly, like we can discuss the house while we're in there, but we're not going to discuss how much you love it or kind of what your overall thoughts are on it. That way you can ask me questions. We can make observations that are general, but any discussion beyond that, we're either having somewhere else completely. We'll go for coffee, or we'll hop on a call later on. See, so it had, like it's that much of a concern that you're actively, actively forewarning clients, like to like watch your conversation because it could 100%. be recording. Even baby so, monitors. See, because I remember like years ago um, when this was like breaking news in the states or whatever, and 
it was like, this is like going to be the next thing where everyone's recording. And then people were like, it's illegal to do it. And I just remember thinking back then, I'm like, well, it's illegal to speak. But, yeah. you know, people still do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I mean, my security system, I've got a doorbell camera out front. I've got a camera out back. And it does. It just saves clips. If it picks up motion, it saves the clip. And I can go back. I can listen. I can watch anything. So even if right. they're not yeah. intentionally recording you. So you can even you can even claim like you didn't have any intent. It just does that thing when you walk. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Oh, jeez. I know. <laughs> like, it changes the things a little bit. And I mean, people get a little bit um, indignant or, you know, not wanting to be recorded. But it's not like it's being invasive. You're going into their house. Yeah. Well, what can you do about it? You just watch. Well, your... even, even I have to admit, like, I would be damn curious if someone was walking through my house, like what, what they're doing. Yeah. Right. Cause I've, I mean, I've heard some stories about people doing some truly bizarre, weird things inside of other people's houses when they've got, when they think they're alone or when they think, do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> that you don't want to hear about it. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's just, in fact, I think there was a, there was a stat. Hold on. I'm going to see if I can find it. There was uh, the amount of people that would, or that would actually do this thing. Let me just give me a second here. I'm going to see if I can, if I can find the stat. Cause if I can, it'll, uh, um, what is it? <clears throat> Cause I just remember thinking if I'm like this, I have to assume that so is everybody else, you know? No, I'm curious. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. So 15% of Americans, here it is. 15% of Americans who have sold their home said they actively use security systems to monitor potential buyers. So oh, 15, 15% of them. Meanwhile, 67% said that if they were selling their home today and had such devices, they'd switch them on when, when buyers come calling. Exactly. So there you go. <laughs> so the, clearly this is something people are doing. I was like, I knew it was a high amount that it would indicate. And I'm like, it makes sense though. Because so, so would I, like I would yeah. do it. Exactly. But I only have a, I only have a, an, or an echo, I think it is. Yeah. But yeah. I don't, obviously it records. I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I don't actually have anything in my house, but yeah. And I mean, whether or not they do go back and listen to it, I don't know, but they do have, they do. I mean, have if I can get an extra $10,000 on my house, because I heard some schmuck talking about my house, how they just have to have it. <laughs> you know, I have what? actually now started to use it. Um, if I think there might be something there and I know my people are interested, I might actually talk a little bit about some of the problems that we've noticed popped up in the house while we're Oh, in. interesting. Because then they might then think like, oh no, we've got some issues here. Oh no, they're not interested. So when you do bring an offer, you <laughs> so, your advantage. So, yeah, so you what you really do is just walk past the doorbell 15 yeah. times Try you know, just to make sure it's always you. recording uh, or echo record <laughs> yeah. man this house is terrible the foundations cracks yeah exactly yeah that's it's interesting like, actually to fix it. yeah and then you just text the agent after hey check those recordings yeah i'm not sure if they were on or not <laughs> <laughs> oh that's too funny yeah it's, it's games though oh um, I it is. Yeah. So then another one that you had on your list mm -hmm. um, is failing yes. to check the neighborhood first. So, I mean, walk me through that one. I, to me, that yeah. doesn't even, it doesn't even feel like a top five because I never <laughs> consciously think about it, but I'm never in your shoes. It right? becomes like, top five when you start pulling up to a house where you've got everything set out. Cause I mean, it's actually some buyers come into town. They're in town for a weekend. You show them anywhere from 20 to 40 houses in one weekend. Like you just go, go, go. So yeah. your timing has to be specific. You're scheduling around your um, drive time, your sellers, everything else. And all of a sudden you pull up to a house and they're like, no, we don't like the neighborhood. Or no, we don't like the look of it. And they don't oh, even go inside. Sense. You've kicked yeah. out the seller who might have kids, everything else. So one of my things when I talk to buyers now is if you don't know the neighborhoods, you need to go start driving around, checking them out. If a house pops up in a neighborhood that you're unsure of, I want you to drive by the house before we book a showing. Actually check out, like not even certain neighborhoods, you have to check out almost every house first. Cause if it's in a good block, you're great. Mm -hmm. If it's a bad block, you might want to avoid it. So it just eliminates um, the time wasters. Like we said earlier, our time yeah. is important. And so when you're trying to fit in a bunch of appointments, the schedule in a bunch where they're just going to cancel when you drive up to the door is super infuriating. Yeah, so I imagine, well, I, I can imagine. So, yeah. then, so the question for you then, <clears throat> let's say, 
let's say that you know you're getting someone from out of town who's coming yeah. in to buy and yeah. how do you how do you like prep them for the neighborhood then or do you like get them to fill out a questionnaire and be like are you gonna like gang bangers living beside you yes for check yes or no right. <laughs> In a real conversation, yeah. I'm like, okay, so if they're the kind of, you know, there's a lot of kind of young, hip couples that come in, they want the little retrofit neighborhoods, they want to get into Riversdale and stuff like that. I'm like, uh, okay, yeah. I know the neighborhoods you want, but are you comfortable getting into a house on a block where there's going to be needles in your backyard, in your front yard, people are going to be passed out in your yard, or do you want to get into a block where most of the houses are owner-occupied, have been turned over a little more, and you're probably going to have some transient element, like, walking by, you might end up with someone in your, but it's not as likely as when you're surrounded by two drug houses. Right. You know, what is your comfort level? And if they say, well, we're comfortable with all of it. Okay, great. I'll show them whatever comes up that they like. Mm -hmm. If they kind of have that pick and choose, I will actually mm -hmm. do a drive by on the block. Oh, interesting. That. Yeah. And you'll like video it and be like, this is how you can get yeah. your, your cocaine at the same time as you get your milk. <laughs> 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 yeah. And yes. if, I mean, if they're looking more at suburban neighborhoods, then you can get a pretty good idea for what they like. And then in a situation like that, if they're just coming into town, I might take the morning, the first morning to like give them a snapshot of a few different neighborhoods. We'll look at a house in a couple different areas. And then from there, we kind of tweak it down. But oh, yeah. OK. Yeah. So, you know, and this isn't necessarily related to this, but it kind of still is. Virtual tours, man, I could have swore like five years ago when it's like, you can walk 3D through all these houses. I used to think, I'm like, man, this is it. Like, like realtors are going to be gone in five years because you're just going to be able to sit on your butt eating cheesies, you know, just, yeah. oh, I like that bedroom, right? But clearly that hasn't happened. Even yeah. with COVID, that hasn't happened. So, like, do you ever utilize those or? I, yeah, I do. I actually do all of it. So for... Most of my listings, I do a 3D scan where they can, they can do that tour where they stop. And that's the one where you can like walk into a room, you can look up, you can look down, you have control over how you're moving through the house. Okay, cool. Or yeah. Rico, Astro Room, there's a bunch of versions of them. Yeah. I usually do that, which is a pretty good tool. On some of the higher end listings, I do like the really fancy video walkthrough. And then oh, yeah. on most of my other listings, I will still, I've got just the little um, Osmo, DJI Osmo. So a okay. stable user. I'll oh, walk okay. my camera and I'll yeah. do my own walkthrough. Sometimes it's just a reel that's really quick. Sometimes I slow it down and almost do like my own little virtual open house where I'll kind of talk people through, walk them through everything. And then I'll post that as well. Some people want that. And then other buyers I do, I will do a virtual walkthrough before they come into town. Like we'll actually, I'll head to the house with my stabilizer, walk them through a few different houses before they actually get here to decide what they want to go into. And then do you include the neighborhood as, as part of that then? You're like, Depends on what it is. Yep. Like you ever do like the outside and walk it and, you know. You know, I haven't done a full neighborhood with the walking as mm. much. Usually with that, I'll, like, I'll still tell them to check out the Google um, Earth. Go know. street view and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Usually a little bit. Oh, deep. yeah, that makes sense. I guess you could just do that too, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. I just, uh, yeah, I just, I, I felt like that was going to be like the thing. And I was like, yeah. man, everyone's just going to be out of business and they're yeah. not. It's, it's still just so different though, because even with Matterport, so with Matterport one, it's a super expensive camera. But that's that big, hunky, big box thingy, right? Yeah. It is. But then if you really, really want to get into things with that camera, you can go put on a virtual headset. You can get your client to stand in the house and walk through the room while they're in the virtual headset. And so I've tried that too, but it's still not the same experience as standing in the house. Like it actually... Right. Um, It'll, it'll pick up every flaw in the house, but it almost overemphasizes them. So sometimes... <laughs> Which is them. always ideal when a house is trying <laughs> to be sold. <laughs> exactly. You're like, this just looks really weird. But so yeah, it's got those options. It's just not quite the same though. Nothing feels the same as getting in there and seeing it in person still. Right. So you basically only use it if it was long distance clients, like someone yeah. going from city to city kind of thing. If like you're in the city, yeah. you're going to... Go get them to experience the neighborhood. Go get them to experience They're the house. Great tools. But okay, so say I went to buy a house in Toronto. I would do all of that pre, mm -hmm. but I would still not buy a house without going and physically walking through it. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. So there you go. It's as great as technology as you'll still yeah. you'll still do the, the, the manual <laughs> stuff, which makes sense. Yeah, exactly. So then. What was our know, The last one on your top five oh, yeah. is this one. 
<laughs> this and one I comes into play on the buying and the selling side. People listening to their friends over their agent. So on the buying side, what I found, especially in a market like we just saw, like January to about July, it's still a busy market out there, but those months were crazy again. It was back into like really, really, really high intense bidding wars. You had to be out there in the first few hours, get your offer in, bid over lists, like minimal conditions on your offers. And there are some people that will listen to their friends and they're like, oh no, my friend has always told me I should never pay over list on a price or on a house. And it's like, oh really? <laughs> has your friends yeah. been around for the last couple of months? Have they just been out to 40 different houses where every single house went 30,000 over list? You know, well, so my favorite is the, uh, the mom and the dad usually are the ones the the coaching. Yeah. And, here, and here's the thing I, I know, and I, this is what I struggle with. I know that the advice that they're trying to give is out of places, uh, out of goodness. They're trying oh, to protect their kid. They're trying to do all like, yeah. I understand it's coming from a good place, mm -hmm. but for them to not realize that buying a home now is not the same as buying a home in the eighties, let alone like last year. Like, yeah, uh, I don't know. It's, yeah, I struggle with that. So this, like even even this week, actually, it happened this week where um, this was mortgage related. But, you know, mom was was very opinionated as to what her daughter should be and should not be signing. Yeah. And she's I mean, I felt bad for her because she just was anxious to all hell, like like physically anxious over this. And she's like asking about all the different like options and stuff like that. And we walked her through all of those and like article after article after article, like basically showing that, you know, mom is wrong here, <laughs> but you know, despite that your mom is pushing like, this is wrong and not in like the, I'm right. You're wrong kind of situation. Like, let's just look at this, you know, logically in what the, the, the outcome is going to be if you make these decisions. Yeah. Um, and not only can you know that to be like true, theoretically, you can see it practi practically as well, because look at all these use cases, look at all these testimonies that have said, if you do this, this does happen. Yes. And you know, at the end of the day, mom still won. And, um, I mean, the, the conversation I had with her is I'm like, look at, you know, regardless, it's going to be okay to some degree, right? Like you might, you might just not be as good or as best off. And, and sometimes it can really, really hurt. But I was like, I want you to know, you can always come back and we can always have a conversation and I will never, ever tell you, I told you so <laughs> never, I will never, I'm not that person, but I'm telling you in advance. <laughs> This one, it does have to be handled delicately, hey, especially when you're dealing with parents, because people very much want to please their parents still, which is just human nature. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah and with friends too. And sometimes that's the only way you can do. You can give them all the information, you can show them the stats, but until they've been through it a few times and possibly lost out on two or three homes, yep. they don't necessarily start to learn, oh, maybe you actually know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, or or parents being like, if you want the house, you got to do like an unconditional offer. It's like, that's so dangerous. Yes. It's oh, like, totally. Yeah, it's, yeah. I've just seen some of like, like, well, like I said, in Ontario, we've heard it before yeah. where it's like, oh, you got to put in an unconditional offer. I'm like, you should never put in yeah. an, un like there is, there are, unless you can buy that thing 100% cash yeah. and you are prepared to write or, and you're prepared to buy something with potentially lots of problems because mm -hmm. you're skipping the home inspection too. Yeah. Like, you better like, uh, yeah, just it's terrible oh, advice. But like, yeah. like I said, th there's so many things that could go wrong if you're if you're listening to the wrong person's advice. <laughs> yeah, exactly, uh, that's true. <clears throat> yeah, and like you said, with the home condition stuff too, we didn't get as much of that this year. There were there were definitely homes selling with no conditions, but it, there were still other ones that did have them attached, which was good. But I've always told buyers that too. I'm like, unless you are a contractor that can go in and fix anything that comes up that could be wrong with the house. And you literally have all the cash. You should never go in unconditionally. Yeah, like, and even even then, like, because there's the financing and there's the home inspection side of it and stuff like that. I just like we had a client and 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 they went and so even when you do all the steps in the right order, it's not necessarily going to work out perfect either. We had a client that um, the house that they bought, they they went and viewed it a lot during uh, during the summer, I believe, but they had to move in. Like they could only view it during certain months. That's when the seller was selling it during these few months. Um, and they couldn't see it early and they couldn't see it late. They had to see, like they had to go visit the house in this, in the middle. And you might know where this is going if you, if you, if, um, if you dealt with this problem before, but they move in, in like September or October. And while they're sleeping, um, there's like <clears throat> little bugs that have like started dropping out of the vents, like onto their faces and like, 
and like <laughs> and like not a, not a lot not a lot of them but like but enough that they're like what the hell are these and they're like they look like bed bugs and so and they're like, but that's a weird place for bed bugs to be. So of course they like, yeah, you know, get them tested. They got an exterminator out there to like come and test it. And the guy's like, I am sorry to tell you, but these are not bed bugs. And like, anytime you hear, I'm sorry to tell you, these are not bed bugs. That's never a good thing. So apparently they were bat bugs. And I didn't even know this is a thing. What? Yeah. Like that's what, this was new to me. I, I'm like, what the hell is a bat bug? So apparently a close cousin or something like that, like twice removed from the sister's brother side from bed bugs. But, so they're close. But, really? they're, but they're not the same yeah and they live off of bats so when you have bat bugs you have bats and so the guy like the exterminator that came in he's like look at man you've got you have like there's only like two or three coming out an hour right he's like but for them to be coming out in this capacity like two or three or hour into your home is like there's a really good chance that you have a crap ton up there he's like because normally you'd see like one every couple days yep. he's like unless you have like a significant infestation is that so here then, this isn't yeah this isn't saskatoon <laughs> oh yeah and they and he, uh yes. and they had done the inspection the inspector didn't catch it because they were in the vaulted ceiling and yes. uh to remove them fun fact you have to take the whole house like the whole roof apart because bats in canada are uh, protected species yes. so you can't you can't just kill them Right. Yeah. And to get rid of the bat bugs, you got to get rid of the bats. And the only way to do it is to literally take the whole roof apart. So well, 50 grand. I about the bats, because I know um, mm. a girl who bought here who had to take all the siding off the exterior of her house in order to get the bats out. Crazy. Then reside it. But I had never heard of the bat bugs. Yeah. And yeah. So, but they're not, they don't, just because you have bats doesn't necessarily mean you have bat bugs. But of course, they're like, they have like a newborn, like a six month and like they'd wake up and find the bat bugs laying beside the newborn and stuff like that. So, I mean, they had just bought this place and three months later, boom, <clears throat> like they were gone. Yeah. I hope and they took the seller to small claims. Couldn't. Why? I don't know. They, they talked. There was. The seller knew about it? There was. So, yeah, they said proving that the seller knew would be impossible. That means the seller never talked to a neighbor because normally that's all it takes is for oh, seller interesting. to start start talking to neighbors and for all the neighbors to be like oh yeah we all knew that they had that and then for oh them really to- well it makes sense though too because they would probably talk to their neighbors i can't guarantee that would hold up i shouldn't speak to that as far as from a legal side of things but yeah i mean i think mm. you could make a case for it but yeah so even that like so that's a case of where things went like wrong even though they took all of the steps right and yeah. like i said you're that's just a really case of bad freaking luck Right. (laughs) But I mean, that is what you're potentially exposing yourself to. If you don't take the proper advice, if you don't take the proper steps of your agent, if you don't. Exactly. Like it's, (laughs) yeah, I know. I was like bat bugs. I wonder what the hell. (laughs) But just like, even when I was talking with the guy and I felt bad for him, he's like, yeah, the, the, um, the, not the inspector, but the, um, exterminator is like, I'm sorry to tell you, these are bed bugs. He's like, that's what I knew. Oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> like anytime you're like, I'm sorry, it's not this. That's not good. No, but, that's not good. <clears throat> but yeah. So, you know, we're already coming up on 40 minutes here. Do you have any, um, like closing thoughts or any kind of like last minute tidbits that you would, if someone's looking for homes, let's, let's say there's a home buyer out there watching this video in the future. Mm-hmm. What, um, what would be your, 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 your number one, what's your number one takeaway? The number one takeaway is always my number one with buyers is always go make sure you have a good solid pre-approval. Make sure Mm. even if you got it a long time ago, make sure it's still current, get all that in place. And then from there, lots of conversations with your realtor, with your mortgage broker, and just keep the communication open. And it's why I like you, Angela. (laughs) (laughs) Because it's way easier to put together a purchase when someone has done their stuff correctly from the start instead of guessing yeah oh yeah yeah <clears throat> well i appreciate you uh you coming on board for this especially yeah, for my sure. my inaugural stream i mean this is great i'm gonna definitely have you on um again in the future but uh yeah i think it was a, a good first start and we'll uh we'll make sure that you're on in the future again thanks a lot that's good thanks conrad